Good afternoon, everybody, and um, welcome to Writing the Record on behalf of the Schlesinger Library and the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. I'm Jane Kamensky. I'm the Fortzheimer Foundation Director of the Schlesinger. Um, and the event this afternoon culminates a really wonderful day of meetings with the panelists who have been extremely generous with their time uh, sharing the day with staff at the Schlesinger, uh, with lunch uh, with students from across the university and with many of our colleagues. Um, my role here this afternoon is to get off the stage so that the dialogue can begin. I'm going to introduce each of the panelists much more briefly than their important work deserves, beginning with our moderator and then going in alphabetical order, which is the order they'll be speaking in. Um, but first, I want to say a little bit about the impetus behind this event, which my library colleagues and I began to organize about a year ago. As the nation's leading special collections library documenting the history of women and gender in America, Schlesinger preserves and makes accessible the papers of women ranging from Amelia Earhart to Susan B. Anthony to Dr. Mildred Jefferson to Harriet Beecher Stowe, as well as the records of institutions working in just about every facet of every wave of the women's movement and much else besides. We hold more than 3,500 manuscript collections stretching across approximately 16,000 linear feet, which is more than enough to fill three vaults, the largest of which is housed, housed right here below us in the sub-basement of what used to be the Radcliffe Gymnasium towering more than 20 feet from the bottom of the college's former swimming pool. It's called the pool vault. As a woman's history archive, Schlesinger is in the business as the London tube announcements have it of minding the gap. The history of women has always figured in archives and museums, but it hasn't always been featured. My colleague Laurel Ulrich recently reminded me that not very long ago, you could walk into a major repository and ask to look at collections relevant to women and families, only to be told that there simply weren't any. Even today, women and ideas about women, gender, and sexuality remain underrepresented in the documentary record. This is partly because, over the long arc of history, women have saved men's records much more often than the reverse has proved true. Within this landscape, politically conservative women and grassroots conservative organizations focused on the household have been doubly hidden by gender and by ideology. Family values conservatism isn't by any means undocumented, but it has been and remains underdocumented relative both to progressive social movements and to conservative movements led by men and or focused on geopolitics. This is not by design on either the archival or the activist side. I think our panelists today are far from alone in thinking about the legacy of their movement work, and Schlesinger likewise has company in thinking about these issues among our peer institutions. The obstacles, I think, have stemmed from a combination of path dependency and mistrust, and I hope we can begin to remedy both of those today. The gathering could not be more timely. The death last month of Phyllis Schlafly, inarguably one of the most significant figures of the second half of the 20th century, reminds us that even the longest lived activists eventually pass into history. We're at a generational turning point where records of the heated family values contests of the post-World War II era will either make their way into institutions or suffer the fate of most of the records of most of humanity over most of history, which is to be lost. We're also at a moment when the necessity of cultivating trust across the political spectrum could not feel more urgent. Two weeks before the presidential election, it seems safe to say that the United States is not suffering from an epidemic of civility. Whether that's a laugh line or not, you decide. <laughs> There's a saying in the world of special collections, archives describe, they don't prescribe. Schlesinger and many, though not all, of our peer institutions see it as our duty to safeguard as complete 
and multi-sided a record of the history of American women as we are able to assemble. It's our job to think about the future as much as the present and the past, to imagine how researchers a century from now will understand our moment and how we can help anticipate that important work. Our panelists this afternoon are uniquely well qualified to open a new chapter in this dialogue. Moderator Ross Douthat has been a leading conservative voice since before he graduated from Harvard College in the unseemly recent year of 2002, magna cum laude and phi beta kappa with a degree in history and literature and an honors thesis on the imperial fictions of adventure writer H. Ryder Haggard. In addition to his biweekly columns in the New York Times, Douthat is the author or co-author of three books, including most recently, The 2012 Bad Religion, How We Became a Nation of Heretics. His columns often wrestle with difficult issues at the center of our conversations today, the politics of universities and the moral legacies of the 1960s, after which, as he puts it in privilege, his clear-eyed memoir of his undergraduate years we, quote, accepted the sexual part of the revolution and put the rest of it aside. <laughs> Donald Critchlow, professor of history and director of the Center for Political Thought and Leadership at Arizona State, is the author most recently of Future Right, The Forging of a New Republican Majority, and is, in addition, the author or editor of more than 20 other books, including When Hollywood Was Right, The Conservative Ascendancy, and the important polit political biography, Phyllis Schlafly and Grassroots Conservatism. He has long been a very public-facing scholar, appearing on C-SPAN, NPR's Talk of the Nation, and BBC World News, as well as in the pages, pages of the Washington Post, the New York Post, the New York Observer, Market Watch, and National Review. Jennifer Marshall serves as vice president of the Heritage Foundation, where she runs the think tank's Institute for Family, Community, and Opportunity. In that capacity, she oversees research into a variety of issues, ranging from marriage, family life, and religious liberty, to health, education, and welfare. Marshall collaborates with her heritage colleagues to explore how moral values and civil society relate to issues of political economy and foreign policy. She also edits Heritage's annual index of culture and opportunity, which tracks indicators of opportunity in the United States, ranging from marriage, fertility, and abortion rates, to labor force participation, subsidized housing levels, and student loan debt. An accomplished scholar and teacher, Marshall holds a Master of Arts in Religion from Reformed Theological Seminary, a master's in statecraft and world politics from the Washington-based Institute of World Politics, and a bachelor's degree in French from Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois, where she also earned a teaching certification. She is currently in her copious spare time pursuing a PhD in religion and culture at Catholic University. Michelle Nickerson is an associate professor of history at Loyola in Chicago, where she teaches on the history of women and gender, of US, politics, of US politics, social movements, and cities and suburbs. She developed her interest in the history of American social and political movements as an undergraduate at Rutgers. And then, despite my efforts to recruit her to Brandeis, where I then taught, pursued her graduate studies inexplicably at Yale. She is the author of Mothers of Conservatism, Women and the Postwar Right, a pioneering study of the grassroots activism of conservative women in the Cold War era Los Angeles. She's currently studying the Camden 28, a Catholic anti-war group so named for their arrest following a raid on the Camden, New Jersey draft board in 1971. Finally, Charmaine Yost, Longtime president and CEO of Americans United for Life is now senior fellow at American Values. She is a second generation grassroots conservative, the daughter of scholar and writer and organizer Janice Shaw Krauss. As an author, writer, and political commentator, Yost has wide ranging expertise in public policy and has served in many facets of political life, including the Reagan White House and Mike Huckabee's 2008 presidential campaign before heading up a national nonprofit. She has appeared as spokesperson or commentator on every major television network and cable outlet, 
and in print in leading national publications. She has been profiled by the New York Times Magazine, the Christian Science Monitor, the New Republic, and Mother Jones, among others. <laughs> Yost holds a PhD from the Department of Politics at the University of Virginia, where her dissertation was Empowering Shakespeare's Sister, The Politics of Parental Leave. She is the co-author of Mother in the Middle, Searching for Peace in the Mommy Wars, and is currently working on a new book related to modern feminism. I've asked the panelists to keep their prepared, marks, prepared remarks short, about 10 minutes, to allow for plenty of discussion among this accomplished group of thinkers and uh, with you, our audience. I hope that the historians will tell us something about their research strategies for uncovering the important history of conservative women. And I've asked them to think, among other things, about records they wish they had had access to and how we might change those paths in the future. I've asked the movement leaders to think about what we might call the other side of the coin, what you wish researchers and future generations knew about your work and how you're tending your own records so that your story will be discoverable. Together, I hope we can both discuss and exemplify the work of building trust with stakeholders and with political opponents. Let this afternoon's work be a paradigm instance of taking each other's other side seriously in hopes of a more civil present and a better documented future. Thank you. All right, so I guess I'm in charge here now. Um, thank you all so much for coming. Thanks for that wonderful introduction and for all the labors that went into putting this panel together. Um, it's wonderful to be back at Harvard. I do a fair amount of public speaking and it has been a very long time since anyone referenced Ryder Haggard or my senior thesis in, in, in the introduction um, or the history and literature, uh, I shouldn't say department, um, but the, the, Harvard, the Harvard technicalities escape me. Um, anyway, I am here essentially um, as a mediator and observer um, who hopes, like you, to learn something interesting from these distinguished academics, these accomplished activists. Um, I'm also here as someone who has some experience with some of the interesting uh, gaps that separate liberalism from conservatism in American life and what you might call elite liberal culture from populist conservative culture. Um, I was not particularly influential as a Harvard conservative columnist, but I was the token conservative columnist for the Harvard Crimson, a newspaper then and now that may have had a slight liberal bias um, in its editorial stances. And I have graduated from there to my current bad eminence as the token conservative columnist <laughs> for another newspaper that might have a slight liberal tilt in occasionally in some of its editorial positions. Um, and in both of those roles, perhaps my role for the New York Times slightly more so, I do find myself often acting as a kind of cultural go-between um, for the groups, constituencies, and positions that I tend to agree with and end up defending. Um, and the, I would say, the slight majority, perhaps, of the audience that actually reads my column every week. Um, so I spend a certain amount of time explaining conservatism to liberals, a certain amount of time trying to explain liberalism to conservatives. Um, and of course, in the last couple of years, everything has gotten topsy-turvy because I assumed that I would you know, inevitably spend my time as a New York Times columnist vehemently defending Republican nominees and the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church to New York Times readers <laughs> who would loathe and despise them both. Um, but instead, I've ended up as a critic of the Republican nominee and of Pope Francis himself, which is a very strange place for a Catholic conservative to end up. So it's been a long year, a long year for all of us, I think, in American <laughs> politics, the world at large. Um, but we're here now. And um, I think that conversations like this are immensely important and projects, broader projects, um, of the kind that the Schlesinger Library is pursuing are immensely important um, because you know, the work of mediation that I do, uh, not particularly effectively in my professional life, um, I think does try and fill a very real and important gap that 
independent of sort of issues of partisan polarization, intellectually weakens our culture and our politics. Um, I think that we have a sort of a level of the bastions of our high culture um, for not out of any sort of malign conspiracies, but for reasons of self-segregation and sort of, you know, inevitable ignorance of cultures that lie beyond their gates sometimes have more limited knowledge than they should of political conservatism, and I would say particularly, in particular relevance for this conversation, religious conservatism. Um, I think that there is a gap in the mind of the American and Western Academy um, where religion in general, and especially conservative religious values, conservative religious ideas, and the history of grassroots political conservatism is concerned. Uh, so there's that gap. But then there's also a gap in the conservative mind, which reflects, again, not a sort of, you know, a sort of deliberate refusal of knowledge and intellectual life, but an understandable sense that if the academy is a bastion of liberalism, then the work that is done in the academy must be inevitably tainted by liberal bias, and therefore all of it can be set aside and all of it can be dismissed with a wave of the hand. And again, we won't make this a conversation about Donald Trump, but perhaps in the story of Donald Trump's rise, you can see some of the limits of a populist conservatism that takes its understandable skepticism of a liberal academy and turns it into anti-intellectualism writ large. Um, so those are, I think, those gaps in the conservative mind, the conservative populist mind, the liberal academic mind, are hopefully a kind of useful backdrop um, for us to keep in mind as we listen in on a conversation between academics and activists about um, the specific work that they do, the projects that they're engaged in, and the ways that they, in their own professional lives, try and bridge those gaps, um, and the way that they think, um, as Jane suggested, about their legacies, and the ways in which the this, this strange realities of being an academic studying movements that regard the academy with particular suspicion, the strange reality of being an activist thinking about your own legacy and knowing that it will be scrutinized in institutions that have a reputation for being hostile to the causes to which you've devoted your lives. Um, and then finally, I think the particular issue, um, particular to Radcliffe, Jane brought it up, the particular issue of sex and gender is also just a fascinating one because it isn't just it isn't just that there is this sort of broad-based gap and gulf of understanding between populist conservatism, religious conservatism, and the academy. There's a particular gap and particular incomprehension, I would say, between, between um, in certain ways, the academic feminist mind and the female religious conservative mind. And I say that meaning no disrespect to either of those minds, which I have engaged with um, from the outside as a member of the opposite sex for much of my life. Um, I was born and raised by a mother who was in the first class of women at Yale um, and cast, her, cast the first presidential ballot of my young life for Walter Mondale and Geraldine Ferraro, and she was very insistent that she was mostly voting for Geraldine Ferraro. Um, so going back a long way in my life, I, I've had exposure to the to sort of the complexities the complexities of the female experience and the complexities of feminist thought as it interacts with religious experience and with the politics of conservatism and family in the United States and we had a lot of arguments as a as a family and um, most of those were arguments sometimes my mother was having with herself but around the dinner table as I grew up so um, so that I think is the final that that specific issue um, is, is a fascinating, fraught, and vexed one, um, and one that I think is amenable to much more interesting academic and intellectual discussion than maybe its experience to date. So with that slightly rambling introduction, um, I see I'm two minutes ahead, and I'm going to turn those two minutes over to the panelists in the hopes that they use them wisely. Um, but I intend to be a ruthless moderator. They have a clock that they can watch that will tell them when their time is up. Um, each of them will speak, and it, when they're done speaking, I will try and guide what I hope will be an absolutely fascinating discussion for about 20, 
20, 20 minutes, um, and then we will open the floor for questions, friendly, hostile, or somewhere in between. So thank you all very much for your attention, and I turn it over to Professor Critchlow. Supposed to set, are we? I mean, it, already I'm the bad moderator, but yes, I think <laughs> okay. I think we're in a, in a casual, informal way. I'll be shirtless by the end of the talk. So. <laughs> well, we don't want that, I don't think. Probably not. <laughs> I want to thank uh, Jane Kaminsky and the staff of uh, the archives for really a splendid, well-organized uh, event. So we've been treated uh, very well. And I want to thank uh, Jane Kaminsky for mentioning my book, Future Right, the Forging of a New Republican Majority. I think it could be found in the science fiction section of Barnes & Noble, so. <laughs> that, that book uh, got trumped, I think, but anyway. <laughs> I want to say a few words as the uh, political biographer of uh, Phyllis Schlafly and use that as a segue into talking about the uh, difficulties of writing a, a biography of a controversial uh, political figure, but also uh, use it as, uh, as kind of an opportunity to see about expanding collections of uh, conservative uh, uh, women. A longtime political activist, Phyllis Schlafly, who died, as was mentioned in September, she's best known for her work on uh, her activism in defeating the e Equal Rights Amendment in the 1970s, which was a major uh, defeat for second wave uh, feminism, or at least perceived so at that time. Phyllis Schlafly's uh, Activities and the defeating of ERA, I think, are of some historical importance, especially uh, at the time and today. How it's going to be, its, it's actual importance historically in 100 years from now, I think will uh, we'll have to be uh, determined. Her activities, though, extended well beyond uh, uh, anti-feminism. She was uh, active in the anti-communist movement prior to this in uh, debates over nuclear uh, strategy uh, before she became involved in, uh, in um, the ERA fight and then helped organize uh, the pro-family uh, movement uh, and, uh, and grassroots uh, activism. I think in order to place uh, Phyllis Schlafly into a broader context, we need to understand her abilities as a political organizer and, and personality uh, that went into that, as well as uh, her, 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 uh, her, herself personally, as a person, that is. The one thing that I think was important about to begin with, I think one of the most notable uh, uh, characteristics of Phyllis Schlafly is that she was a ferocious uh, debater, anyone who uh, knew her, and she was uh, exceptionally uh, thick-skinned, um, with a very strong uh, ego, very strong uh, ambition. She wasn't an especially uh, reflective uh, personality. Uh, thinker. Uh, she prided herself on her uh, polemi polemical uh, uh, abilities. She saw herself as kind of the Thomas uh, Paine of, uh, of the right. She was quite adept at uh, balancing, I think, throughout her uh, career, the Republican establishment um, and party leaders, as well as the, uh, the, the grassroots right, which was often at odds with uh, Republican, the Republican uh, establishment. She, her ideologically, and I don't think she had a systematic ideology, but what was important uh, for her was her Catholicism, uh, but also the model that her, her parents, and particularly their mother, her mother, who was college educated, 
uh, presented to uh, Phyllis and her uh, sister. They instilled upon their two young daughters in the depression that uh, they should uh, achieve success. And uh, Phyllis uh, Schlafly uh, uh, rejected a scholarship uh, to, in, to go to a local Catholic school in order to go to Washington University, the Harvard of uh, St. Louis. And, um, and then she went to uh, Radcliffe where she studied uh, political science. When she left Radcliffe, she was um, a Republican, uh, but she was also an internationalist. She was a strong supporter of the United Nations. She returned to St. Louis after failing to get a, a, a government job turning down an offer uh, by uh, faculty in political science to get her into uh, law school. Um, and uh, there, there, returning to uh, St. Louis, she became politically active, running a political uh, campaign, a, a successful one in 24. That's when St. Louis had uh, Republicans in the proper uh, city. And then, uh, and then she pursued a successful uh, uh, career in, uh, in banking. When she married uh, her husband, Fred Schlafly, who came from a regionally prominent uh, family, her politics uh, changed. Fred Schlafly was uh, older than she was, uh, and he came out of uh, the isolationist uh, right, and, uh, and she uh, imbibed their, uh, his politics, and she basically became part of the old right, very strong, uh, non-interventionist uh, points of view. In fact, she told me uh, when I was working on her biography that after the, first, after the Second World War and the Korean War, she'd never uh, supported another military, American military intervention, and that included uh, Vietnam, and the uh, and recent uh, in excursions into uh, the uh, Middle East under both uh, Bush um, presidencies. She she became involved in uh, Republican uh, politics as well as grassroots uh, activism. So she was kind of balancing between the two. Um, this kind of adeptness at, uh, at, um, in, in, in getting both sides to work with uh, one another. Many grassroots uh, anti-communists were very suspicious of the Eisenhower administration, uh, for example, and later uh, Richard Nixon. She told me at, uh, later after I completed the uh, biography and it was published, that um, initially, initially uh, the ER, Stop ERA campaign did not focus on abortion because many of uh, the Republican, many of the conservative women, especially Republican women, actually supported abortion. This was a, a strong, a long-standing tradition and uh, or sentiment within the uh, Republican uh, Party up until the uh, mid '70s, uh, they believed in in, in uh, reducing uh, global pop population as well as uh, population in the United States uh, for um, for reasons of trying to address uh, social uh, problems. She gained fame on the national stage, obviously, with the uh, book on a choice, not um, an echo. On the, um, and that made her into a, a, a public uh, persona, which was later carried into uh, the campaign of, uh, in the ERA. She was, um, so I think to understand Phyllis Schlafly is to understand both a public persona as well as a private uh, persona. Um, and privately, Phyllis Schlafly, and I know this might be very hard to uh, believe, had exceptionally uh, good sense of humor, uh, 
was uh, 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 was uh, a fu a fuli. Uh, her uh, daughter, in fact, uh, runs a major uh, cooking conservatory in uh, St. Louis. She was also a health nut uh, in the 1950s, eating organic uh, food. So there was this kind of uh, private uh, side to, um, to, uh, to Phyllis uh, Schlafly. And in that private side, she was totally devoted to her uh, children. She, she held a view that, uh, uh, that really, I think, has been misunderstood by many historians and scholars writing about uh, uh, female, or about Phyllis Schlafly and her followers. But Phyllis Schlafly didn't believe that women shouldn't work. After all, her mother worked in the Depression. She worked uh, um, her way through uh, university and afterwards. Uh, what she did believe is that when women, uh, when married women have children, their primary uh, devotion should be to their children and not their uh, career. Um, and I think, uh, I think that's uh, important to understand about Phyllis Schlafly. So just a couple points, and we could pick this up in uh, discussion uh, a bit. I had uh, serious uh, differences with uh, Phyllis Schlafly politically, although she knew I was uh, a rare uh, conservative in academia. And so why did she agree to uh, have me write her uh, a political biography and allow me to have complete access to her extensive archival uh, collections as well as the uh, personal uh, financial papers of uh, records of STOP ERA. And there were two reasons, I think. First of all, and I think this is important for getting uh, collections, Jane, uh, there was ego involved. Uh, she wanted to have a bio she wanted her, her legacy to be uh, known by future generations. Um, and I think that's important for trying to attract collections uh, that, that you're going to be able to convince people that they'll have a legacy beyond their, uh, their, their, um, their own activist uh, lifetimes. The other, the other thing I think that was important in allowing me to get such as, access to her papers was that we established uh, a, a personal uh, rapport even though I was in St. Louis at that time, uh, I hadn't met Phyllis uh, Schlafly prior to uh, one meeting, and she had given me a biography written by a journalist, and then I suggested to her a full-scale biography, a political biography might be warranted. I would I become interested after writing on uh, family, federal family planning on kind of this emergence of uh, the uh, anti-abortion movement and the grass rights uh, conservatism. So, um, so she, she understood that I was a scholar. She understood that I was going to use about 40 other archival collections across the uh, country to check on, uh, on her uh, views and correspondence with politicians and, um, and grassroots uh, activists. She didn't oversee the uh, writing of the book. We agree early that she couldn't, uh, she wouldn't have final uh, consent on it. But she, uh, she did understand that it wasn't going to be a hatchet job on her, uh, bringing her uh, out to be uh, uh, a right-wing uh, right uh, nut. The other, uh, just two other points uh, very quickly, is that what I found in, uh, in talking with Phyllis Schlafly, when I tried to uh, conduct formal uh, interviews with her, she put on her public persona. Very, very guarded, uh, basically gave me the, you know, what you would expect and how she wanted to be portrayed. What I did find in working in the archives, however, that I could caught, if I could catch her you know, between uh, walking the halls, I could ask her a question about what I had just seen. And she was much more relaxed and would, uh, 
tell me things. In fact, one of the, I realized, and I'm not a postmodernist, uh, but uh, I realized there's a real problem for historians uh, working in archives and try, you know, and this was contemporary history. I think it's even more difficult when you have uh, in the 18th, 19th, or ancient history. Uh, but you're, 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 you base your uh, work on, uh, on text, or either archival documents or written, written texts that have uh, survived from ancient times. And, and so if you get a series of letters, for instance, talking about an issue, it, you might think it's even uh, more important than it actually, than it actually uh, was. And I'll tell you a story about that if I'm asked during uh, discussion. The other, uh, I think the other problem, she was uh, exceptionally well uh, organized, had uh, extensive uh, archives of about 50 uh, uh, metal cabinets full of, uh, of documents. I convinced her that they should be archived and be uh, preserved, but she, uh, after I was able to use them, she subsequently uh, closed them. She was concerned that uh, people uh, would, uh, researchers would come, on, come in and find things that could be used against her in her own uh, political activism. Uh, the, the archives are still closed, uh, at least they're preserved, and I think um, her, um, her support of uh, endorsement of uh, uh, Donald Trump uh, have, has caused uh, family uh, disputes uh, uh, within the family, and so there's legal action uh, going on. I think right now the, what's going to happen to the archives uh, will, be, um, will be seen for the uh, future. So I think I'm, I'm a minute and a half uh, early, so I think I'm right on pace here. No, no reason to take off your shirt yet, Ross. <laughs> Thank you. Well, very fascinating to hear uh, about uh, a great lady and her work. Um, I want to thank you, uh, Jane, for planning this day. It's been uh, remarkable, really, and, and thoroughly enjoyable to uh, be hosted well and to be in the midst of conversations that I think represent the best of the academic and civil discourse traditions. And as already been mentioned today, uh, those seem to be in short supply in our uh, world today, in our country today. So it is a uh, true joy to be here. And thank you all who are part of putting on this important conversation. I, I want to uh, thank you in particular for putting together this program, which provides, as Paul Harvey would have said, the rest of the story. Uh, we've been asked to talk about how the diversity of the documentary record could be uh, increased so that researchers would be able to compile more complete and balanced histories of our times. My answer to that is to take conservatism on its own terms, investigate and present its stated principles, rationale, and aims, discern its internal coherence rather than imposing extrinsic theories on it identify authentic representatives and emblematic expressions of it. As the best teachers remind us, we should be able to understand and articulate uh, fairly an opponent's case in order to effectively engage it. As the best archivists explain, we should understand both sides of a social debate to do justice to its history. Indeed, public discourse and civic harmony depend on such open-mindedness. In the case of the social history we're discussing here today, there are some particular obstacles that get in the way of taking conservatism on its own terms. And in this light, I was intrigued by some concluding remarks in my co-panelist, Dr. Michelle Nickerson's book, Mothers of Conservatism. She suggests that feminism's dominance in recent women's history may present an interpretive obstacle to understanding competing movements and worldviews. Quoting from Michelle, has it, feminism, become a central logic for determining the value of female political identity well beyond the scope of its own historical influence in ways that possibly distort our understanding of women's history by simplifying representations of human actions? She goes on to note, feminism assumes itself to be freer of outside determinants 
than anti-feminism to clearly see the world through women's eyes, end quote. Well, theories that assume sex is the explanatory factor in worldview, ideology, and political expression cannot make entire sense of the diversity that we see around us in the world today. We need investigative methods that acknowledge ideological and political differences among women and among any other group for that matter. So I, I agree with Dr. Nickerson when she concludes that we need to investigate how subjects came to see the world as they actually saw it. And that is, I think, what our hosts here today are proposing with regard to preserving the records of conservative individuals and institutions. So what should investigating and collecting look for when it comes to the conservative movement for life, marriage, and religious liberty in particular? Let me mention three things. The first is to take seriously the conservative account of the principles and rationale for our perspectives on these issues. To begin with, this means taking conservative on, conservatism on its own terms literally in its self-description rather than applying predetermined labels. It also requires attention to its basic concepts, such as its understanding of rights, for example. On the conservative account, government is not the source of rights, but merely the guardian of inherent natural rights to which each and every human being is entitled by their very, very existence. Endowed by their creator is how the Declaration of Independence, how the framers of the Declaration understood the origin of these rights. These are terms understood by reason, and indeed reason is a common currency to which conservatives appeal as we seek to make our principles and our goals accessible and evident to all. Any investigation or collecting should look for such a reasoned case in the midst of any public debate. In addition, religious conservatives' perspectives are often deeply shaped by a biblical account of the nature and purpose of human beings and human flourishing. And uh, the way that God has made us to exist in community as a part of that flourishing. As a result, investigating conservatism means taking religion seriously, not as a construct to wield social power, but as a reasonable response to the questions of meaning, purpose, and ultimate ends that face all human beings. Second, take seriously the conservative explanation of our aims. Conservatives stand for life, marriage, and religious liberty because of our interest in the natural rights, freedom, and good of all. This is not an argument of a self-serving interest group, but a coherent account of the common good. The right to life, for example, is grounded in the same principle as the equality of women and men. The original purpose of marriage policy was to preserve, as far as possible in law, the right of a child to be raised by the mother and father who brought her into the world. The protection of religious liberty is essential to guarding fundamental freedoms of conscience, speech, and association for all. Third, discern authentic representatives. Any investigation must identify accurate representatives of a movement to study. This requires an understanding of the principles, rationales, and aims, which I've been describing and others, in order to discern who are the exemplary proponents of them. This is not to suggest that a movement can be reduced to a single figure or should be, but it does mean being able to discern between central and peripheral or fringe aspects of a movement. So I wanted to point to a couple of examples that I uh, thought did a good job of some of the things I've been talking about. And one happened just recently in a Slate article, um, The New Culture of Life, that ran on the 11th of this month by an author named Ruth Graham. And she was talking about the future of the pro-life movement, growing support uh, for life among uh, the millennial generation. And the article described a diversity of different strands of, of um, 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 efforts in the movement, but they were uh, all around this central theme. And I thought that did a good job of capturing the diversity. I also want to commend the planners of this event for the choice of image that they chose. Uh, Pro-woman, pro-baby, pro-life as the emblem of uh, this event. That does a fair job, I think, of capturing how pro-life uh, women and men would express our viewpoints on this issue. Well, in conclusion, uh, I'll just note that Paul Harvey's coverage of the rest of the story 
didn't merely supply a trivial postscript to something that was already a full story. Often, it shed a whole new light on the subject. In the same way, taking the conservative account of the last half century of cultural history on its own terms provides the interpretive key that makes today's challenges in intelligible and offers us the tools for better public discourse on these critical matters going forward. Thank you. Good afternoon. I want to start also by saying thank you very much to the Schlesinger and uh, Radcliffe Institute. Um, I can't express to you what a pleasure it is to be here. I would have never imagined um, back in the late 90s and early 2000s that a problem that caused me so much stress as a researcher trying to find uh, women, conservative women in the archives, would land me on a, in a discussion on this stage with such distinguished company um, that uh, I get to talk about um, with you. So thank you. Uh, as a way to talk about this problem as I see it, I want to do three things. Um, the first is to outline why I think it's in our interest as a historical community to collect the papers of historical, excuse me, conservative women. Second, um, I want to explain, uh, if I may be so brazen, why I think it's in the interest of conservatives to deposit their papers in university archives, particularly places uh, that are open to the public. Um, and third, I want to raise a question uh, about some difficulties that uh, we need to address for moving ahead. But before I get to these items on my agenda, uh, I'm going to talk just briefly a bit about my experiences of trying to find conservative women in the archives to kind of set, set up these agenda items. So this goes back to my years as a graduate student when I was trying to do research for my dissertation. It was the turn of the 21st century, and I was enthusiastically joining a wave of new scholars studying American conservatism. And unlike most other ABDs and newly minted PhDs in the field, I uh, was also interested in women and gender. And I say most. Uh, I had a very important predecessor here, Lisa McGurr, who's in the audience, who um, wrote another very important book on women and conservatism. I was actually interested in how Cold War era housewives of the 1950s built important institutions, networks, and organs of grassroots conservatism from their suburban Los Angeles homes, um, and how they established important building blocks for the emerging movement to come. My earliest forays into historical archives were difficult, though. It took many months for me to get my legs, because when I first talked to archivists, they would tell me um, that they really didn't have anything for me. No collections on conservative women. There was always a but. I discovered um, that there were, in fact, women in these archives. One just needed to know how and where to look. Uh, they would tell me things like, well, you know, we don't have conservative women, but we do have this radical right collection that was at the Hoover. Or um, we do have the Sarah Diamond collection at the Bancroft, and you might, you might find women in there. Um, or there were the spy reports of the Los Angeles Jewish community relations. These are, you know, groups spying on conservative groups and so on. And I, my, I, I found some incredible riches this way. Um, but for the most part, women were not jumping out of these papers. I found them, um, I, I found the papers by finding the real, live, breathing women. Um, every day as I combed through the records of organizations, government documents, political documents, I would keep a list of names of women and um, after lunch, I would sit in front of a computer uh, at the archive, and I would look up phone numbers in the online white pages. And then when I would go home in the evening, I would make 
cold calls. I would just call people. And um, eventually I would get a hit. Um, and I met some really important women, some, some really fascinating activists. Um, I managed to record their oral histories and examine troves of historical documents that many had stored in their homes. And if I have, if there are archivists in the audience, you know what I'm talking about, people who just would go to events and collect things. Um, and this brings me to my first point, why it is in our interest as a historical community to collect the papers of conservative women. Now by historical community, I mean all of us in the business, scholars, activists, public historians, teachers, because this problem that I had finding conservative women's papers is the problem of conservatism, as outlined by Alan Brinkley in 1994 in the American Historical Review essay that, among other things, inspired my research. Uh, this article is literally called The Problem of American Conservatism. U.S. political historians, he argued, had failed to basically explain the success and nuances of the American right in, in history, a problem he correctly attributed to failure of the, quote, historical imagination and, quote, basic lack of sympathy for the right among, among most scholars. And to further apply this interpretation by Brinkley to our problem here today, there's just no way we can fully capture the national fabric or political landscape if we don't seek a diversity of voices in the record. In that vein, it's necessary to emphasize that we need to collect the material of conservatives who we don't necessarily see every night on Fox News, okay? So what I'm saying is it's not just elite conservatives, it's not just the people who you think of when we say conservative who we have to collect. And that category doesn't just include women. It also includes black Republicans, Korean Christian conservatives, um, and others who don't come to mind when we think of Phyllis Schlafly. Second, although I'm not conservative myself, um, I am nevertheless going to make suggestions here uh, to my conservative colleagues of why I think it's, it's, it's good to leave collections in the archives um, and to leave them in public institutions rather than places that restrict access. I think it offers the best chance of inserting oneself and asserting oneself into the historical record. To make the, the, to make the papers of a person or institution available for research is to put names on a particular set of events before scholars even look at the materials. It is, moreover, a good way to determine how the very meaning of conservatism itself will be defined for posterity. We historians, it is true, have the right and duty to produce our own original work based on the application of disciplinary analysis. And it will often not square with the ideas and intent of our subjects. However, to have influence on what a collection is named, to determine what gets put in there is one way of setting terms before the scholar even sees the materials. Historical archives are the first places we go for sources. My last item today concerns the internet, social media and talk radio, since it seems to me that so much of what constitutes the conservative movement and, and basically all politics today is taking place online. And what I found out really encouraged me today on my tour of the library, because it's starting to happen. Uh, the Schlesinger is figuring out how to collect these materials. And so I think that moving forward, we need, if we're going to document the record of American politics, it's institutions like this one and others that are accessible to the public where we need to be able to find the conservative movement. Um, and like I would invite the audience members, for example, just 
Google conservative mom blog. I mean, see what comes, see how much comes up. Um, and with these questions, I'm not only gonna point to the difficulty of pinning down what conservatism is and will be, especially coming out of this election cycle, but how the archive of the near future is going to represent politics in the new media age. Thank you. Well, let me start by adding my thanks as well to each of you for taking the time to be here. It's deeply encouraging to see an event like this, to have pretty much every chair filled. And um, for someone like Professor Mansbridge to take the time to be here, Dean Cohen, it's a testament to your leadership that this is happening. And Jane, I want to talk about my deep admiration for you in a minute. <laughs> um, Jane mentioned my mother, and I wasn't planning to talk about her, but I thought I might start with her because my earliest memory of my mother is falling asleep listening to the sound of a typewriter in the other room. And, you know, I love my MacBook, but there's something about the sound of a typewriter. And to me, it's a very maternal sound because my mother worked on her doctoral dissertation after my brother and I went to bed at night. And um, I think that's important for you to know about me as a person. It might also be important for you to know that my mother was a teacher when she became pregnant with me and subsequently lost her job as a result. I tell you these stories because I am an embodied woman. I live as a woman in this culture, and I've had many of the same experiences that my liberal feminist friends have had. There was quite um, almost an earthquake online uh, this last weekend after the Trump tape surfaced, and there was a Canadian author who asked women to tweet at her their experiences of sexual harassment. And she started off by telling a story that had happened to her on a public bus when she was 12 years old. And it stimulated in me, I hadn't thought about the fact that I'd had as almost the exact same experience when I was 12 years old, when a man exposed himself to me in public, rubbed up against me in a crowd. Um, and the reason I tell you that is because I had a visceral reaction as I read 9.7 million women the last time I checked had responded to that thread. And the point was to talk about the fact that as women we have these unique experiences that are, no offense gentlemen, I appreciate your presence here today, but these are, there's some unique vulnerabilities that we have. My daughter, when she was in college, was attacked by a sexual predator. Unfortunately, she was okay because, um, but anyway, it was, but these are, these are experiences that we have and I share that in common with women in general. The reason I start with that is because I've titled my brief remarks, Trust and the Other, Trust and the Other. Because Jane, in asking, inviting me to come to this, she mentioned the word trust. And in our exchanges, putting this panel together, we've talked a lot about trust. And that's a real issue. And I thought I might tell you a few stories that illustrate the challenge of trust from my perspective as a conservative woman engaging with women's issues throughout my career. Because despite all of these stories that I tell of holding in common a feminine experience in this culture. I've been accused of internalized misogyny, of not being a real woman. I've been told on multiple occasions that because I'm pro-life, I can't be pro-woman. And those kinds of experiences create a feeling. It's a way of generating, of distancing, of saying that you, as a woman, you're not really a woman. You're the other. You're this other category over here. You can't be a part of our movement over here. And so it decreases trust. That's why, as I lead into saying that I do really appreciate Jane putting this event together, I, frankly, when you first called me, Jane, I didn't trust you. Um, it took several conversations, um, and it was really so fascinating to me 
we had a chance to have breakfast this morning and just, you know, before we ended up talking about the panel, we talked about a whole range of just personal things. We ended up talking about some sort of issuey kinds of things. And it's always fascinating to me that when you can sit down and talk as real people, real person to real person, there's so many areas of agreement, of agreement about issues. That doesn't mean that you end up coming out on the other end agreeing about what should be done about issues. But it's a productive conversation when you can surface common experiences and common emotions and common challenges. That helps you to build a groundwork of trust and a platform to talk about how you move forward and to brainstorm about different ways of moving forward. And the reason that I, you know, frankly, I've always really liked the concept of the other because it generates so much that's helpful about clarifying how we can undermine our conversations with each other. Because what happens when we throw away round terms like internalized misogyny is that those of us who might hold different positions from the prevailing ideology become a caricature. We're not real people. There's this idea that somehow we haven't experienced some of the same things. And so suddenly you're not interacting with a real person who has real motivations, but you're interacting with a cartoon, and that's not productive and that's not helpful. And the other thing about the other that's important is that it generates an unreasonable fear that also undermines productivity. I was absolutely fascinated going through the um, Holocaust Museum in DC. I learned a lot. I actually had never been exposed to the propaganda that uh, the German um, that preceded really the the rise of World War II. You know, just to you know having that wonderful experience today of going through the library, it makes a difference to get to see the actual materials of something and to see the pieces of propaganda about the Jewish people that were put out prior to World War II. There there was this generation of fear of what their motivation was and what they were going to do to um, to the German culture. And I think that's what happens. Um, I see this a lot in, the, in my experience as a pro-life woman. I'll read something that is meant to be a descriptor of what's going on in the pro-life community, and I don't recognize anything in it. Because there'll be this fear that permeates the article. And I've actually sat with some colleagues, and we've laughed, and I've said, have you ever sat in one of those conspiratorial meetings where that particular agenda was being discussed? And I can tell you that many of the articles I read about um, these conspiratorial meetings, they don't happen. And the agendas are not as they're described in these more fear-laden kinds of descriptions. And I believe that's completely rooted in a caricature of who the people involved are. Let me give you an example, and this is, it's lighthearted, and I, I hope you'll find it as funny as I did at the time, but here's the personal experience that I had with this. So you mentioned Mother Jones. So they were coming in, and of course there was a little concern <laughs> about the interaction with Mother Jones, and so in order to um, hopefully communicate the uh, a pro-woman message, I made sure that there were several of the female attorneys that um, worked with me who were part of the meeting. So it was me and I think two female attorneys and I actually invited my daughter in too so that we, so it ends up being an all female meeting because the reporter was as well. So I like salad. <laughs> and so we ordered a big bowl of salad from Chopped. Um, do you have Chopped in Boston too? Yeah, of course. So uh, the female reporter walks in, and I'm just trying to be jovial. So I make a joke with her, and I say, well, hey, since we're all women, we're, we're going to have salad today. Oh, ha, ha, ha. And she laughs, and we all just, I, it was a throwaway comment on my part. I hope now you all don't think terrible of me because I like salad. But um, So here's the funny part. The fact checker 
from Mother Jones followed up with our media person and said, is it true that you only serve salad to female reporters? <laughs> <laughs> and our media person responded and said, well, we're really a fan of all of the food groups, so. <laughs> I appreciated her. So anyway, that's been one of my favorite jokes is that, you know, I am uh, I actually really like steak. But in any event, um, I, I, I really don't want to repeat too many of the wonderful list of things that Jennifer has already laid out. But two, two points that I thought of that I would want to underscore is as we interact and try to understand each other's positions better, I think it's really important to ask ourselves, are we assuming bad faith on the other part? And I challenge, I challenge pro-lifers and pro-family people on this as well, because you know, I, I don't mean to assert that this is only, that this is a one-way street. On either side of a very contentious political issue, you tend to project off bad faith. And Similarly, in a parallel question would be, you know, how do we interpret motivation? What, how do we, what are the assumptions we make about why a particular person is engaging on the issue that they are? I was deeply affected by another life experience I had, which was I had the opportunity after the Reagan White House to spend a couple of terms doing an independent study at Oxford with Dr. David Cook. And so... You know, they have the wonderful, um, uh, thank you, <laughs> and very different, very different learning process than ours, and so it's challenging, and I sit with him, and he says to me, so, tell me why you're pro-life. I'm like, oh, this is easy. I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm off to a good start here at Oxford, because I'm a little intimidated, and I start talking, and I tell him, you know, start trying to tell him why I'm pro-life, and he brutally cuts me off. And he says, no, that won't do at all. Your first writing assignment is to go write a paper on why a woman should have a right to choose abortion. And I was like, what? <laughs> That's not what I came here for. And I have to tell you that it was one of the most formative professional experiences I had in my entire life. It was a very difficult paper for me to write, and I learned so very much. And I, um, in my time teaching, I've assigned that paper to a few people, try to flip it, whichever person you're dealing with. Um, we need to challenge our students, we need to challenge our young people, we need to challenge ourselves to constantly be working to understand our, I hate to say opponent, our, in, our, our, are those with whom we are interacting? Why? Why are they interact? Why are they engaging in the in the way that they are? Um, and I'll try to try to bring this to a close. Um, uh, Jane also mentioned the the New York Times and the Christian Science Monitor profiles of me. It's always really kind of interesting to go back and see what a reporter takes away from from interacting with you. But I tell you, in both of those experiences, I had really intense conversations with the reporters, who, and their reaction was that they had never really heard the rationale that I was articulating, the idea that somehow you could be involved in the pro-life movement because you were motivated um, from a pro-woman perspective. And like Jennifer, I too was really struck by your image. You know, things like this make a difference when you create an event. I can't tell you how many events I've been to where from the very start, the imagery, the framing, everything is meant to bracket you off as the other, as someone who is in some way engaging in a diabolical way, to, to give us the dignity of articulating our position that we are pro-woman, we're pro-baby, pro-life. That is what I try to articulate in uh, professionally, and I appreciate you, you doing that in, in the event poster. And I think as we move into a situation where we may actually have the first female president of our country, these issues are only going to become more intense as we, as we grapple with that uh, potential reality and, and 
what it means to be pro-woman and how how we engage together moving forward uh, deeper into the century. So thank you for your integrity and your welcoming spirit. And I'm very grateful for this event and for your leadership in putting it together. Well, that was a very positive note to finish up on. Um, and finish up phase one. So to begin phase two, I'll try and introduce not negativity, but some areas of tension that I think I picked up on um, in the course of these wonderful presentations. Um, so I have a couple that I'd like to raise, uh, but I thought I'd start with something that I heard come up in interesting ways. Um, both Jennifer and Charmaine talked a lot about the importance of, um, I think that when Jennifer was talking about it, it was just the idea of sort of grappling with the other side or the side you're studying, whatever term you want to use, grappling with their best arguments, their real arguments, taking ideas seriously on their merits, not just always looking for sort of the hidden motivation, the hidden secret, and so on. And um, obviously, Charmaine picked up on that idea as well. But that, that argument, and it's an argument that I agree with and find very powerful. And in my work as a journalist, I spend a lot of time effectively, I think, urging my readers to grapple with conservative ideas at the highest level that I can raise them to, which is not always very high, but um, high, high enough, hopefully, for newspaper work. Um, but that, that cuts in interesting ways across the reality that both our academic participants are talking about and sort of have embodied in their own careers, which is the sort of grassroots versus elite divide um, in any politics, but in conservative politics in particular, um, where you are, as an academic, you have an obligation not to look for the weakest argument or the most sinister argument that the other side might be marshalling, um, but to look for the arguments that individuals and movements actually believe at the grassroots level that may not always be identical to the arguments that are made at the elite level, whether in academia, newspaper, columns, policy papers, or anywhere else. And I think that this tension is of particular relevance, I'm sorry to bring it back to crass politics, but in the age of Donald Trump, where a lot of what's happened in conservative politics over the last year has been a kind of revelation of the gap between what people like um, myself and Jennifer and Charmaine in different ways um, argue and believe in and what many conservative and Republican voters preferred to have argued for and believed in by their presidential standard bearer. And this obviously isn't the first time this has happened and much of the history of Phyllis Schlafly and the rise of the grassroots right reflects a tension between the grassroots and the elite level. Um, so I guess this is maybe first a question for professors Critchlow and Nickerson, but really for for anyone, to what extent, uh, how hard is it to sort of finesse that balance where you're simultaneously trying to take ideas as seriously as possible and deal with the most serious articulations thereof while also being alert for the deep tensions that open between um, sort of populist currents and what the elites say conservatism or liberalism, this obviously applies across the spectrum, is and should stand for? Yeah. Um, so I think it's um, important to uh, begin with an understanding that most uh, historians, scholars, um, and academics tend to view uh, the world through uh, ideology and ideas. Uh, that, and so they find, uh, so they'll look for often inconsistencies in ideas, whether it's textual analysis or uh, in a person's career. But I think ideology needs to be uh, separated from politics, the actual, uh, uh, the actual nature of politics. Uh, and what I mean by that is politics is about power, winning power. And in democracy, it's about winning election. So you'll find uh, politicians and uh, uh, and political actors such as uh, Phyllis Schlafly uh, 
uh, sometimes inconsistent, but not not just driven by uh, a, a consistent ideological uh, view. When Phyllis Schlafly, for example, uh, began her um, career in politics, um, she had she helped organize in the 1950s in St. Louis. She organized a discussion club, and on that discussion club roster were uh, speakers were libertarians, traditionalists, uh, just a whole mix of different kinds of uh, people. So if you, were in Wash if you were in New York at the time, reading National Review, you would think the world was being filtered between this uh, debate between libertarians and traditionalists and, pos and ways of fusing the uh, two. But out in the hinterland, uh, people weren't uh, debating those kind of issues. There were, it was, it was, it was, it was passionate at the time about anti-communism, and then it was going to be other issues. So my point is that, uh, my point is that I think historians too often want to look at uh, uh, political figures just in solely ideological kinds of ways. And they, they want to also look at politicians uh, in, in this kind of way. And I also think in our political discussions, we tend to uh, often, folk, especially within the academy, focus on ideas. But politics is about passion. It's about winning uh, elections. It's, uh, it's about getting those kinds of votes that, uh, necessary to win election. There's not a lot of, uh, there's general, what we would call in political science, uh, political beliefs, a general view of, um, of how the world should work, but not a consistent, uh, it, not a cons systematic uh, world view. And there's not a lot of strategy, actually, in uh, politics. That is long-term uh, strategy. It's basically, I know a lot of politicians, um, um, and it's basically a strategy a year out on how to win an election, and often it's closer than that. But the distinction to, I'm going to take my privilege and just leap to Charmaine for one second, because, or no, go, go sorry, go, go Sorry, ahead. I wanted yeah. to follow up yeah. with that, because I think um, Don raises a really important point, especially when he talks about Schlafly's discussion groups. Um, and it, it actually points to an important tension that Jennifer raised um, about who is going to represent conservatism in the archives. Because um, when, when Jennifer talks about, OK, uh, you, know, you want people who represent what conservatism really is rather than, um, let's say, um, maybe people you would call the reactionism of the, the current uh, political crises of the moment. I, mean, I, I, I identify with reaction personally, but no, really? I, no, no okay. but yes, no, no, I that, take your I was going to say, wow. Yeah. But, okay, but kind of what this, what this kind of gets to is um, the fact that this becomes really difficult. So um, when we talk about the differences between the grassroots and elite, um, one of the things that historians have done over the past let's say 20 odd years, is introduced what we call social history to the work of political history, where we're, we're looking at um, the kind of work and the, the everyday lives of activists. Um, and so we're also finding um, non-elite actors um, and the work that they're doing in their homes um, that you're not going to read about in the National Re Review, even though those activists themselves are reading the National Review, but they're also, um, that's not what I found in my research, Don, sorry, but, um, <laughs> oh, okay, but in the 1950s they were, and, um, but they were also doing some things that elite political actors would refer to as crackpot. Um, they had some ideas, they, they were spinning conspiracy theories. You, in fact, we, you, you might even call it reactionism at the time. Um, it was pretty populist. Um, and so, but yet they were very important to uh, the emergence of the John Birch Society and the Goldwater Movement. So it's hard, it's really hard to determine who are the real conservatives and how do we decide whose papers 
we need to place, right? And I'm not saying that my, what I have to say about it is the most important. I just think that it's, it's just a little but bit difficult. This is a minor interjection. Even to recognize that those different strands exist is a step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. but, but you also come to these moments, and we've had one in this election cycle, where some version of the grassroots that is not supposed to be official conservatism suddenly becomes politically immensely important, right? And I keep, I keep thinking of watching the Republican presidential debates and how many times did Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz desperately explain that Donald Trump was not a conservative in capital letters, basically. And that, you know, that made a difference to a slice of the Republican electorate, but not enough to deny Donald Trump the nomination. I just wanted to ask Charmaine, as someone, you know, as someone active in a cause, a, you know, a not, you know, you, the, the pro-life movement is obviously a deeply political movement, any movement would be, but it's a movement organized around a single issue, a single philosophical position, a single idealistic worldview. When you hear Professor Critchlow talking about sort of the idea that, well, this is just, this is just politics, right, and sort of, I, I, didn't, I don't mean to say that you're, you know, downgrading idealism in any way, but, and when you think about the year that religious conservatives have just been through with Trump, I'm just curious what your reaction is and how, you know, how, how you see that playing out maybe specifically in sort of the way, the different ways that people in your movement have tried to negotiate the rise of Donald Trump. I think there's more strategy among politicians than um, I, I want to gently disagree with with Don's characterization there. I think, you know, certainly they will be more caught up in the immediacy of the tactics of whatever election happens to be in front of them. But I think that both movements and politicians who endure for any amount of time have to have a longer horizon. And certainly, you know, in the pro-life movement right now, there's, there's a lot of ongoing conversation about what the next horizon looks like in the wake of um, the, the June decision in the Texas case, for example. So, you know, there, there will be a lot, of, a lot of strategy around that. And certainly following November, regardless of whether Trump wins or Clinton wins, there'll be um, a, a, a much longer horizon. Yeah, I guess what I'm getting at, though, is not to put you on the spot, but there is this sort of, there's a very specific civil war over whether, over how you marry idealism to tactics, basically, with the specific question being, should pro-lifers and religious conservatives more generally um, support Trump? And I guess I'm wondering sort of, you know, and, and it's, uh, um, any, anyone can sort of take this up, but from the vantage point of 25 or 30 years from now, I mean, how, how do you think, do you think that this moment is a real crisis for the movement, or do you think it's one of these sort of political moments that will fade into the landscape of, oh, that was sort of a tactical debate that came and went once Trump was defeated? No, I think that elections are always a crack in time. They're, they're significant. They, they make a difference. It's, they are, in many ways, an organizing structure around which we create our history. And so it, 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 will, be, it will be significant, and it, and it does make a difference. We, we were talking a little earlier, though. I think that we can, in many ways, downgrade history by thinking it's completely unique. We, we go through these cycles in American politics. It's one of the reasons that I study politics is I think our founders were brilliant in the way they set up our system in that it is resilient in its ability to reform and recreate. And I think that that is what you will see happening. But it's the other thing about elections is that the results do matter and winning matters. And so I don't think anybody can really tell you what's going to happen with these different factions that have materialized and revealed themselves until we see what the results are because the results themselves will make a difference in how people interpret what happened. Yeah, if I may, um, 
I wasn't suggesting that ideas don't matter. Uh, I think ideas do matter, but they, uh, but they matter in uh, degree. And what I was suggesting is that um, when you're, the politicians who are running for office and they arrive at uh, policies, it's not, it's, it's often to, uh, it's, it's not necessarily calculated. And I'll give you two uh, very quick examples of this. Of, um, that there's a, there's a, a l large literature in uh, history that uh, Republicans in the, um, in the South after, uh, after desegregation had ended and integration had come, uh, albeit slowly and not fully, that uh, Republican uh, strategists decided to tap in and, and orchestrate campaigns against busing and uh, affirmative uh, action. And that was uh, the way of uh, defending, uh, defending uh, the segregationist uh, white privileged uh, order. And I, I disagree with that kind of uh, uh, narrative in this way. The Republicans were able to uh, win the South beginning in the 1950s on the, on the presidential level, and then uh, very gradually down into the, uh, to the local level. It was going to be a long process. But where they tapped into uh, voters was primarily Republican voters was in the suburbs. Newt Gingrich wasn't elected from uh, mule-driven uh, redneck uh, farmers. Uh, but from uh, Ala fairly Atlantic, uh, wealthy uh, suburbs. The Republicans were able to win the South primarily on the suburban vote. And obviously, people who moved to the suburbs to get, many had, uh, to get away from uh, uh, Sunbelt suburbs, to get away from problems of the inner city, which were uh, racial. But most people moving to, but the major force, uh, I think, drive, moving to the Sunbelt, was uh, better jobs, cheaper living, uh, cheaper houses, safer schools, and better schools for their, uh, for their kids. So there was a racial component. And, um, and busing, uh, and the anti-busing and uh, anti-affirmative action kind of sprang, sprang up um, in the 1970s, and Republicans decided to tap into those issues as a way of winning elections. More to the point, Phyllis Schlafly uh, cha and her followers challenged the Republican establishment on, uh, on ERA. The Republicans' uh, leadership from uh, Ford and even Reagan, uh, although he, he waffled on the issue, were pro-ERA. So, as the grassroots movement and the ERA movement uh, spread, and they and and it was learned that you could tap into uh, religious uh, voters, uh, white women voters who got mobilized around ERA because it had become a symbol of kind of an attack on on themselves, motherhood, their roles in society and a large buildup accumulation of what they saw as attack on uh, their religious beliefs, Republican operatives at that point, who were basically outliers, not within the party, but political strategists, decided to tap into uh, that in order to win elections. That's how politics works. It's much more complicated, as I was suggesting, than just kind of ideological uh, you know, systematic ideological uh, views. And I think that's important to understand the dynamics of kind of grassroots activism and how it plays into uh, uh, politics. And then quickly, I do want to open it up to questions, but I guess this can be a question for both Jennifer and Michelle in, in different ways. But the, the idea of sort of S studying, studying whether it's the grassroots or the elite, but studying ideas. Um, I, I noticed Jennifer was talking about a piece about the pro-life movement that you liked um, that was in Slate. It was written by Ruth Graham. Ruth Graham is, I believe, like you, a graduate of Wheaton, um, and she's not a member of the religious right. She's not a sort of religious conservative in her writing. But as a journalist, it's very clear to me, at least, as someone who's read her for a while, that her writing 
the sort of sympathy and seriousness of her writing on religious issues is informed by the fact that she has personal, friendly, lifelong exposure to actual evangelical Christians. And so I wondered um, both for you as a sort of professional conservative and for you as an academic studying conservatives, to what extent is the kind of imaginative sympathy necessary to really write about ideas possible in the absence of real lived personal experience? Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is sort of in certain ways the big question for the professional academy with its you know, general liberal tilt as it approaches um, the study of conservative politics and ideas. Yeah, good question. That was the most exciting challenge of my research, I thought. Um, well, when I started, I felt like I had two really good examples. Um, Kristen Luker's Abortion and the Politics of Motherhood, um, which was sociology um, when I started, and then um, Jane DeHart and John Matthews' book on um, the anti-ERA movement, um, and I have to say, Professor Mans Manbridge, Mansbridge, your work um, was also very influential. I think you're here somewhere. I, I wouldn't even recognize you. Thank you. Um, and uh, this work, if you can, to me, this is such an incredible feat of um, scholarly imagination. If you can put yourself in the shoes of someone who uh, you don't agree with at all, um, to me, that's, it's, it's, an, it's incredibly rich. It's an incredible opportunity for you as, um, as, a, as, as a writer, I would say. And I feel like that was, that was the gift of my project, that I could be given the chance to do that. Um, whether I succeeded or not, I have no idea. The only reason I think I might have somewhat is I've been in some graduate seminars where a couple, the professor would say, okay, to the students, do you think she's conservative or liberal? <laughs> uh, and the students didn't know. I was like, are you kidding me? Um, and so, I mean, at least I fooled them. Um, but whether I was able to really transport um, the readers in the way that I felt like Luker did, um, or to Hart and Matthews and Mansbridge, I don't know. Um, but I think that if political historians could sort of do it and do ethnography in that kind of way, then we'd all be very well served. And I'll just say that um, it, it's difficult for me to answer this outside my voice as a scholar doing what we hope, you know, is work in, le in thought leadership. Um, so I'm going to answer inevitably from that perspective. Um, I, I suppose it would be just to tell the researchers and the archivists out there that our sector exists, people who came to this movement out of ideas and wanting for the true exchange of debate on ideas. Um, my work has nothing to do with elections and with the political machinations of getting 50% plus one, you know, those kind of things. It, 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 and so it's neither that populist thread that, you know, ebbs and flows. It's, it's not the, the how do you do the election formula. It is day in, day out, season in, season out ideas. And in that, you know, anybody on my team who's writing and I'm editing, I'm pushing them we don't do motives, we do ideas. I want you engaging the ideas in what you write. Um, we don't do ad hominem, we do, we do ideas. And so in, in that regard, I guess, um, that hopefully illuminates something that's out there as a, a distinct uh, category of, of uh, social history that ought to be told. All right, um, we're going to take questions um, for the next, the clock is moving and telling me exactly how long. The next four minutes and 39 seconds. These will have, oh, the fire marshal wouldn't, oh, 13, you've just gained us 10 more. It's amazing power. So please, I'll just call on you. Um, please, obviously, as always, oh, there's a mic, okay. Yes, anyone? Anyone who would like to ask a question should rise, proceed to the microphone, introduce yourself, ask a brief question, or at least raise the, your voice at the end so it sounds like a question, and above all, be pithy. 
I just want to, my name is Jordan Jankozik. Um, I'm an archivist at Brown University. I work in the John Hay Library and Special Collections. Um, thank you guys so much for that fantastic discussion. Um, I really enjoyed it for several reasons, but of one being, and Jennifer and Michelle, I think you might find this of particular interest. Um, before my current position at Brown, I was actually the project archivist for the Hall Hoa collection of dissenting and extremist propaganda. Um, and it is a collection that has over 40,000 organizations. Gordon Hall was a collector. Um, he was the person who had donated the collection to Brown. He has since passed, but he collected from both the right and the left. Um, we have a lot of information actually about ERA, and we have both women for ERA, um, information on women against ERA, Massachusetts for ERA. Um, we have information on pro-life organizations, um, also pro, um, I guess not pro, but for women's rights organizations. Um, and it sort of covers the entire spectrum. But in order for Gordon to give us the collection, they had to do a lot of convincing. He was very nervous about giving it to a liberal um, organization and a liberal university. And Brown, I Brown think, is considered liberal now. <laughs> so much. I don't has know changed. if you know much about Brown, but it's you know considered you know. Um, but in no. any case, he was nervous about a collection of that nature going to a place where it is perceived and it does have that um, stigma attached to it. And um, I think our job as archivists and as historians and researchers is, is to explain to people that that's not what we do. We make everything open to the public. We make all of these records open to the public. And I guess, I guess my question for you is what would you, what do you think about um, organizations like that and, and convincing donors to release their collections and their information and putting it out there. You mentioned that it needs to be collected, needs to be out there, but what about people that are reluctant to do so because of the bias they think that may be put on it? Jennifer, I'm gonna let you mm -hmm. oh, that. Tell me the full name of the collection again. It is the um, Hall Hoag, um, Dissenting and Extremist Collection of Propaganda. Dissenting and Extremist, okay, I guess that's a little wider category. Um, I only heard the word extremist at first. Um, so, I, you know, this, this is um, a conversation that hardly enters the yeah. room in, in my world, in, in conservative um, policy. And so this is why we're, we're commending Jane and her team to such a degree is because uh, these are important questions that you should know are not being asked, um, perhaps outside the handful of people in this room and, and a few others that, that you interact with at your schools. Um, so I, I think it's a new question. I think it's, um, you know, in some ways, the, we've been talking today a little bit about the modern conservative movement, which is only now um, uh, beginning to kind of have papers to relinquish and to pass on to second and third generations of that movement. So it's an opportune time to start asking that question and having those conversations. Um, it will be exposure, I think, to Ross's last point that, it is, and, and uh, the illustration Charmaine gave earlier, it is the face-to-face -face conversations that I think will build the trust uh, to make that a potentiality. I was also thinking um, it's important to think about how you're gonna organize these collections in different series to attract researchers. Um, it's interesting to me that, um, so what kind of involvement did the donor have in, in naming the collection? Uh, he was actually very involved. Um, before he passed, he was actually um, organizing the collection himself with um, organizational categories, and he had over 50 organizational categories, which after he passed away, we realized that was a little much. Um, mm -hmm. But really anything you can think of, he had a category for it. Wow, yeah. yeah I want to say that uh, that collection at Brown uh, as well as uh, University of Kansas, uh, University of Oregon, as well as uh, Hoover, are really important collections and include quite a few uh, women in, the, uh, in these uh, collections uh, that date uh, far back. So what we're discussing is not really, um, uh, not, there, there are collections out there, pre, quite extensive, and the Brown Collection is just absolutely an extraordinary uh, collection, uh, and it needs to it needs to really attract uh, 
considerable more uh, researchers. But just one other very small point. Um, one of the problems is institutional collections, uh, not only individual collections, but institutions. And institutions really don't think very much in terms of uh, archives. When I was uh, a guest scholar writing my dissertation, a guest scholar on the Brookings Institution, they actually didn't have an archives at that point. And uh, they had papers floating around in the uh, institution. And I suggested that they uh, create a, an archives, which they sub subsequently did. Um, but, it, but institutions don't think in terms of historical archives. They might have corporate archives uh, so they could look at correspondence. But that's, that's a, I think, a major uh, issue for any archives because institutions want to protect themselves while at the same time you know, they, uh, they don't think historically. I mean, uh, the Brookings people who are quite wonderful uh, and gave me access to their papers, they didn't think historically at all. And when I talked to them about their, uh, their archives, and AEI was like this too, by the way, Heritage would, came along uh, later, they're like most policy wonks. They're not too interested in... Uh, in history, although some are historically informed. The danger Can of I history is it might show that your policy doesn't work, so you don't, you can't, can't have that. I, I might just throw in there, you know, there is no real shortcut to it. It's human to human interaction like anything, and it's over time, and I can't tell you how many times, you know, we'll see events where there is no conservative included at all, and it's that layer after layer, an accretion of lack of trust. And um, so it's, you know, there was a study the other day showing, you know, 0% Republicans in some, I don't, in some political science, something or other, you know. So things like this is if you, if you just need to be really intentional, um, particularly, you know, at lunchtime we were talking about how technology um, can separate and divide us. You know, there's this increasing problem of, of having your silos and 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 um, and your filter bubbles on online, where we're not. None of us are getting as much information that comes at us because we do have more choice now. So we have to be much more intentional in our personal news gathering. But I would say that's the same analogy for you in terms of your. Um, trying to resist kind of this increasing balkanization that we have in our culture because everybody has so much choice in what they consume. Okay, I'm a really fast talker, so I promise I'll be quick. Um, I'm Leah wright Rigger. I'm a professor at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, and I know a couple of you, so hi. Um, good to see you. So um, the first is a really quick, quick comment that leads to my question. Um, and I'm specifically thinking about specifically thinking about one of the reasons, another reason we might think about um, the, this kind of work being important. And I think it's important to think about how these things change over time and how they don't necessarily nicely and neatly line up with partisanship the way that we imagine them to be. Which brings me to my question, which is this plays out in particular ways um, when we talk about intersectionality and when we talk not just about women in conservatism, but about African Americans in conservatism, Latinos in conservatism, LGBTQ in conservatism, right, Asians in conservatism, and on and on and on. Um, so I was just wondering um, maybe if the panel could comment on some of the ways that we can think about from an archival perspective of getting to those narratives that are really, really hard to get to. In particular, I'll just give you an example um, um, that I'm familiar with, um, getting the papers of black women who are conservative is really, really, really hard. Not because black women aren't necessarily conservative, in fact, there are you know, there's streams of them and strains of them, um, but because that conservatism rarely translates into partisanship. Right. So, you know, if the assumption is, right, or the, the accurate con uh, assumption is that Black women are the least likely to vote Republican. But actually, when we look at conservative, self-identified conservatives, they are most likely to be black women. So how do you solve that problem? Yeah. Panel. Well, <laughs> if I may, um, 
I'm, I'm sure many people in the room uh, know you here at, uh, at uh, Harvard, but why don't you, you're just not being a good academic. You need to put a plug in for your book. Uh, <laughs> it's a really quite, quite good so, book. I, so. I, I wrote a book called The Loneliness of the Black Republican. Uh, it's not a memoir, but it's a scholarly look at uh, <laughs> Black voters, race, and the Republican Party and conservatism, 1936 through roughly 1981. And starting round two and, and looking at uh, similar things, 1981 to present day. Yeah. So, yeah. You're on your way. <laughs> <laughs> Number one, let's just illustrate that, uh, underline the fact that you're pointing out an important research methodology question for all of conservatism, which um, for those are not uh, synonymous categories, conservative and Republican. So number one, we need to get that category straight. And then number two, heartily um, concur with what you're saying. And so I guess as conversations of this type are starting with all conservatives, the diversity of those conversations needs to be kept in mind. Yeah, it really, uh, so I, I'm thinking, um, first of all, through personal papers of particular women, also through nonpartisan organizations um, of women who, uh, and you, you might know of some that don't identify as, as Republican, but might identify in more conservative terms. Um, and you better than anybody might know what those terms were, even if it wasn't conservative. So from my work, women would call themselves patriotic. That was their word for conservative before conservatism was a movement. Um, and so uh, when, I, when we raise this question of, well, how do you define conservatism? Um, so you would be one of the people to, to kind of help try and identify and set those terms. Do you have any ideas of what those terms might be? I mean, there are a lot of different terms. I think, so, so I, I'm, I know we're, we're short on time, um, but I think it's worth thinking about how some of these organizations that um, identify as, like you said, patriotic or identify and coalesce around certain issues but then argue that they're nonpartisan or apolitical or what have you um, are kind of undergirded by um, a number of these people that we see doing this kind of work that again doesn't translate into partisanship. I also think it's um, worth looking within, and this is maybe, um, that's kind of the grassroots part, mm -hmm. looking at a top-down approach and so looking at how certain policy initiatives are developed, political initiatives, program initiatives, that don't necessarily look on their face a particular way, but when we look at the nuts and bolts, and again, this is, maybe this is a plug for the Kennedy School, but <laughs> you know, when we look at the actual nuts and bolts of how these things are developed, it's not that it's Republican, Democrat, but instead people who are coalescing around very specific ideas. Um, and I do think it's important as we think through these things, in particular, um, you know, we, we tend to, when we think about intersectionality and when we're in the, within this conversation on conservatism, we tend to think of, um, of these various racial groups. But especially amongst this emerging conversation on LGBTQ issues and conservatism and how they're intersecting in very different, um, different ways. I'm gonna try and squeeze in one yeah. last question with permission from the powers that be. Thank you very much. I'm a 45-year-old uh, mother of three daughters, and I want to thank you all for this panel. Um, I saw the, the billboard up on in the midst of Harvard Yard amidst uh, my lunch hour during work. And I'd, I'd like to speak because I, abortion, I don't really think, falls between necessarily party lines because life circumstances can reach a vortex and it can create a very um, difficult and complex um, confluence of circumstances. And what I would like to speak to is how there is a barbell effect within abortion within our country that no one wants to discuss. And if we're going to talk about archival records, where are the archives of those who have been through abortions? Because abortion in our society is considered a forbidden grief. It is not one that can be vocalized. It is not one that you can talk about in public with friends. It is not one that is uh, for open dinner discussion. It's not even one where in the uh, pulpits of our churches nationwide, our own religious leaders feel comfortable addressing the constituents and parishioners with, within our diocese. So 
it's, it's a very multifaceted and uh, obviously complex, um, well, condition and uh, tragic circumstance, but the, the barbell effect, you know, the end result is the same, but for those abortions that occur between 18 and 25, it's usually for many different circumstances than for those that occur between 35 and 50. And if you study abortions, you'll see that there's a great number in that, in that bracket that fall towards single women that it's not for them, they, they don't want to have a child and they're pursuing their collegiate career and, and academics and then it thins out. And then you have fetal abnormalities, you have um, family makeup, uh, there can be gender discrimination that goes on uh, within, within a family. If it's a family of, say, three boys or two boys or three girls and there's an unexpected pregnancy. And these are real issues that no one is... Uh, they, they, they are indeed. I'm just wondering if, there is an, if there's one particular aspect, if it's the archival aspect, the nature of stories and narratives about the experience of abortion that I could just have the panel address. Is that, would that be the yes, issue? Yes, I, I would like to know where these archives are, are, are held. Okay, well, if I could just both that specific question, but also more generally for anyone, anyone on the panel, I think the issue of, you know, an issue like abortion in particular, so much of the sort of surface political debate coexists with, yeah, these sort of, these hidden stories or stories that exist. In my, in my personal experience, I would say I encounter the most stories of abortion either in sort of very explicitly feminist writing or very explicitly regretful sort of Project Rachel style pro-life writing, that those, those are the two places, both of them clearly outside the mainstream, mainstream media, but yeah, And I please. was gonna say, unless historians can cor correct me, but we don't have uh, much documentation in US women's and gender history on, um, on what you're talking about. Um, there is a book coming out with University of California Press by Jennifer Holland on the history of um, abortion crisis centers. Um, it's not gonna be out in the next year or so, but um, there is coverage of uh, much of the experience and testimony that you're talking about. Um, and it does fill in um, some of this gap in the historical literature. Um, but because of the problem of the, you know, the fact that we're not gonna, um, we can't access medical records um, where women talk about these things, it's really only gonna be where, in those places where women have testified, often um, in intimate or religious settings where we can, we can find their voices. Um, and it, does, it represents a challenge to us as a historical community. I don't know of any historical archival sources. And I'm... And, I, and, and my, my question is because do they not exist for a reason? And secondly, I'd like to um, just say that I admire the, the course and topic of the paper, the dissertation that you have to give, and as it pertains to our Republican forced, well, candidate that we all this upcoming election, we have we have life, you know, before and that before birth, and then there's life after birth. And I would like to say that the idea of this person taking office, when I have three daughters that are in a very diverse uh, public ma school, ma'am, I I appreciate it very much, but. I'm afraid that is my Trump, role as moderator is not to end with a condemnation of Donald Trump, but to end by thanking, thanking the panel and thanking you so much for raising a very important question. So thank you and thank, please thank the panel. Thank you all so much for coming.